you know, be running a phone over there. But I mean, you can press your own speaker as well. Yeah, Keith is online and Dan is online too, right? Or I don't see Dan. Yeah, Dan's on. Oh, Dan's on. So we're all on. Sorry. Okay. And so when you have uh, to do, especially if you allow Keith to hear you, is to hear press you the speaker button when you're ready to yeah, talk. Right, yeah, yeah. And we've got the set because there is no audio feed into the room from the, we don't have that. Uh, so if you just please remember to push, push your speaker button. And if you hear, if you see me go on. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm good now. Okay, good. Uh, so a little louder will we'll work, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, many meetings that I've been to over the years, um, you know, still need more help from the senior. So you have to keep establishing the line. I think we have three out of the four members. Uh, you're saying it's kind of surprising. It's recording. It is it's recording. It was recording. Yeah, it should be recording. Come, you can sit here if you can't do it over. Second, just as a reminder, if you want Keith to hear you, you have to speak into the mic. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, and that's where we're recording too, so we need him to. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So, uh, recommendations and updates. Tom, um, is your phone, is your mic on? My, my mic is on. Okay, good. Here. Thank you. Okay, much better. So, uh, recommendations and updates. Patrick, you want to come leave this and then keep coming in later? Yeah, so we already did the minutes. All right, great. You guys are. We have two sets. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's two sets. Excuse me. So the minutes from May 3rd, the first one we did is uh, May 20th. So we'll then also do the uh, April 13th. Actually, uh, I'm sorry. The first one was on February 25th. February 25th was the first one. I take that in my notes. And then the second one. Stephanie, the second. Uh, so those are agreements. There you go. Okay. So um, just uh, some updates before we launch into the recommendations. Um, cash at the end of the March quarter was around, around 337,000. That's the cash at Metro, not the cash at the custodian. This is the pool of money we use to pay pensioners. Yes, this is the pool of money we use to uh, pay the pensioners. Um, we replenished that on April 1st. Um, the, if you recall back in March of, uh, 2020, our S and P strategy that is managed vol took a lot of risks off. We manually operated that strategy somewhat manually. Uh, but, uh, as of April of this year, we went back to the normal, uh, managed volatility approach. Um, the, um. The 457 Metro Max administrator contract, that's the VOYA folks. That's up for renewal next year, not this year, next year. We were, I was, what was it? No. So we will, we will visit that when the time comes. That, that RFP takes a long time. It's more than a six month process. Um, so norm, normally on an annual basis, I try to review the cash flows from private equity once a year after we have the December 31 numbers. That's, we've been doing that for quite a while. However, when I looked last year in March, when we met in April last year, we did not do that because I think we were just dealing with the calamity of a market that happened in March and we were focused on some new investments and I failed to do that. So I'm going to do that a little bit more thoroughly than normal right now because we, um, well, Michelle wanted that, and also 
we're going to be making some changes to the investment policy. So it's good to kind of get a good feel for what's happening. So the way this works is uh, the top part here, the, the, this part, is all the privates combined. That's fixed income, alternatives, private equity, and real assets. And it shows at the beginning of 2020 how much we had committed historically and how that changed over the years. So the commitment increased by 228. What we paid in capital, so we paid in 316 million in, during that year. Um, uh, capital to be funded. These are outstanding commitments that have not been funded. So how did that change? Did it go up or down? You can see here that it, overall it went down. Uh, cumulative distributions during the year. So we got 324 million. So you can see here that we had calls for 316, distributions uh, for 324. The cumulative valuation change. So this is a gain in valuation in excess of the, the what this this is. Um, total, uh, total value, um, uh, this is total value change, so that's total value uh, in the beginning period, end of period, and that's the value change. And then net benefit since, since inception, and that's basically the, how much you've made, both in capital gains and, and realized, unrealized and realized. So um, you can see briefly here, I'm going to be, yeah. So what are the dates of these numbers? This is just this is just a, a calendar year twenty versus twenty one. So, so right, so so March twenty one is is the ending date of the twenty one period, and then the one the prior year. March. Yeah, sorry, it's uh, we're going by March and March, so uh, that's that's when the numbers come in. Um, okay, so on the fixed income side, we did commit. Uh, the commitment increased by 130. Remember, right after the um, right after the financial crisis, we added about 120. That was not really in the plan. It was just kind of an opportunistic bucket. Uh, this is the paid-in capital during that year. So this is this is what happened in the last. So so just to be clear, I think Tom had a good question here. So just to be clear, this is the last. This is um, where we ended. Okay, this is the valuation as a. 2021, starting 2021. This is where we were the prior year. So I'm giving you the change. Okay, is that is that clear, Tom? I, I know I know you're um, okay. So it's just the, the beginning versus the ending valuation. Um, capital to be funded uh, actually decreased on the fixed income. Now, more importantly, I want to go down here to the private equity. And private equity, we had uh, increased our commitments by 82 million over that year. We had we paid in 66 million, so those are capital calls. Uh, capital to be funded overall, we have 283 million dollars that could be called in that bucket, and we we call we only made calls for about 15.5 million. Um, that 283 is basically committed outstanding commitments we have, typically. Typically, this would be enough for about a $550 million private equity program. Uh, so this is a very manageable number is what I'm trying to say. However, a program is now worth, uh, you know, in excess of a billion dollars. Uh, so uh, one, 1 billion, 18 million. So this is, that 283 is not enough to sustain that. But what's happening here is just a lot of really good gains. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good problem to have, but it's forcing us to adjust our commitment schedule quite frequently. And I think, you know, we'll talk at a later date, but I think we're ready at some point to increase the private equity just a little bit, but well below the 24% that we reached yesterday. Um, and again, valuations have been coming in very strong. So real quickly, same, I included this information on real assets. Not a lot there. We haven't been very active. We're about to get a little more active today and in the future just to kind of fix some of our returns in that bucket. And that's really all I have on this section, but I'm happy to entertain questions if there are any. We're only going to do this once a year because the numbers just don't change that frequently. Yeah, so just be clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Those are current funds we hold that we committed to. Historically, since inception. Even the ones that are fully paid out? Yes, only people. Yeah, these. This is this number is uh, is including the the very first one done in two thousand. Yeah, in two in nineteen ninety nine, one of them was that. Okay. Yeah. So the seven fifty three then is the total amount. 
Yes. Yes. Trading capital, 2.8. 268, beginning at 32. Right, right. It's really the amount that they're paying, clearly, of only the months we have. Right. Okay, so, uh, and this is good to have, and you can reference back if, whenever questions come up as to the cash flows, but uh, you can see that overall the, the program is kind of feeding itself. Now, again, this number is, is you know, a little bit dated about by about four months. Uh, distributions from private equity have been very robust more recently. We've, we've taken about $100 million out net, but that's not reflected in the numbers. Um, uh, um, okay, so the, the the next one is a robust distribution has been used to fund uh, pension payments, private equity. We have a fund, um, uh, if you recall some time ago, um, we focused on really, this is when Summit was, uh, was our consultant, we focused on some regional real estate managers. We picked up Stone Lake uh, for Texas, primarily uh, Austin and surrounding area. And we also picked up a New York fund, Savannah Fund 3. Um, the fund really encountered a lot of problems um, prior to COVID. They were a little bit late investing, so they had a lot of outstanding investments. And if you recall, I updated you about a year ago about the fact that they had that building in that fund, the building that Amazon was supposed to move into. Amazon refused to sign a cancellation um, um, fee agreement to a cancellation fee because of their Amazon. And so uh, when New York, uh, when they decided not to go to New York, we had an entire building that's uh, vacant. And then other projects were still, you know, they were counting on cash flow from those projects that did not sell during that year. So the bottom line is we're expecting to get between 94, and this is just projections, we're getting about 94 to 96% of our investment back. This fund will barely break even. It will not quite break even. Um, what, what, uh, um, what's also needed is about $45 million in, in, in additional equity to ride out the next two years and realize the investments. So they came to the investments with, with, to the LPs um, asking to subordinate the fund, which essentially means issuing equity that's above us. We, became, we become junior in the capital structure. So it, um, it's not ideal for sure, uh, but um, uh, the preference would be that they would have not needed this at all, but the other preference would be that they can sell something in the fund. But right now, real estate in New York is at, you know, rock bottom prices. I think that's going to change over time, but it's just the timing is really bad. So uh, we're working with them on that. We're, we're trying to get them not to charge fees for the extension period. I think it only makes sense, but uh, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work with that. Um, there's no vote needed on this. We'll just have to manage the investment as an LP. I'm going to try to move a little bit quicker here so we can get to the recommendations. Um, so we've seen a considerable improvement in our fixed income alternative portfolio, including the energy. Uh, you're going to see that in these numbers and, and more to come later. Um, um, we are, you know, over the next three to 12 months, we will try to decrease our overexposure to domestic, uh, to domestic equity and favor alternative fixed income. Keep in mind that it is an either or because, because we're trying to manage the risk in the overall portfolio. So when we're that over allocated to private equity, we've got to take it out of equity. So, it, we're, we're, you know, so we're, we're managing the overall risk as well as being opportunistic. Fixed income, is there anybody that's delinquent on the payments? I'm sorry? Is anyone delinquent on the payments now in the fixed income portfolio? So, look, uh, this is a very complicated question. There's a lot of properties that have received um, uh, arrangements, okay, where either they keep paying mostly in the hotel space. Uh, our our rental properties, like multifamily, renting, housing, all of that are, tend to be... Um, uh, a class, the class A properties are usually more expensive in their region and more modern and newer. Uh, rent collections are as good as they've ever been. But hotels, a lot of hotels, are, especially destination hotels, not like 
you know, travel hotels, like for example, New York hotels, San Francisco hotels, LA hotel. So there, there are, uh, however, we've actually um, have seen improvements in the valuations because people are resuming uh, some of the some of the loans that they were getting from the government helped them pay some of the some of the payments that were outstanding, but uh, I, I would not I don't want to give you the impression yeah, that safety. if I don't want you I don't want to give you the impression that if I went through the entire portfolio right. that there aren't like here and there issues where this guy is is shut down because of COVID or so on so there are instances but they're not meaningful to create a valuation issue for any particular fund except. Uh, this fund um, uh, that I just talked about, Savannah Fund. We also have a Courage Fund that had, you know, 1.1 multiple, and they they had a, a bridal. I can't remember the bridal. It's bridal, you know, for bridal gowns, you know. And that business shut down completely. They're relying. That was a big chunk of the fund, so that's going to be as fat zero. Uh, so that fund will turn capital. So in the worst case scenario so far on a fund level, we've seen two funds that are going to return our money without a gain. That's basically where we are. Um, out of a, you know, about a 140 funds. So is the courage deal, and that's just been a major portion of that fund? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is, they had a couple, a uh, couple of, you know, had some winners and some enough losers that uh, or break evens that they it's going to eat up the fund. The last valuation has been 1.1 multiple, but I think they gave me indication it's probably going to go to one. Okay. Um, so we increased the commitment to Pimco Tac Opera. You gave us authority to do 100 million in this fund, and we did 40, and then we gave them another 20 million commitment. So again, this is part of trying to increase. We're going to try to pivot away from equity, just based on valuations and and uh, so on, and create more room for uh, for that. The next focus is uh, really China, and um, the the both uh, both. Uh, NEPC and I think that there are some opportunities coming up in China, basically because of some of the government uh, um, areas of focus. And if I don't mess this up, uh, um, oops. So basically, starting on the left, um, the, the they have they have communicated that it will be open for investment. They want foreign capital because they cannot satisfy the government and banks can't satisfy all the investment needs. And they're also allowed uh, realizations for foreign investors through COVID. We've had private equity, right? we had some go public, which is great. Now, the, um, the focus area, uh, and this may sound a little bit familiar to you because I've kind of said some of this stuff before, but real quickly, uh, they have announced that over the next five years, they're going to make major investment in their supply chain improvements. Uh, this isn't just highways and bridges this is actually distribution and and so on that deals with more, more infrastructure as well as technology you've also heard me talk about domestic brands they don't have a lot of domestic brands so development of brands has been a big ongoing theme in our portfolio um, healthcare demands are soaring due to the aging population and we know we have a lot of partners venture capital firms in the u.s that are also um, doing this in asia that, uh, that know how to do this, um, developing software for hospitals, tracking costs, so on and so forth. And uh, again, uh, it looks like there is going to be somewhat of a, uh, if not a Chinese wall, a Chinese Swiss cheese, I don't know, <laughs> uh, some, some limited technology back and forth between the West and, and China. And so they're going to have to develop their own. And, and that's going to be another area of opportunity. So I just wanted to highlight that. I know I've talked about it in the past, but that's going to be a theme. Our, our private equity portfolio is very heavy on U.S. venture. That's going to still be the case for quite some time. Uh, we're just going to try to nibble that down a little bit by exposure to other, other areas, uh, not necessarily um, buyouts. Um, okay. With that said, I'm going to launch into the recommendations uh, that are on the same page here. So I'm bringing you this back in a little bit of slightly different fashion. Um, uh, the co-investment fund has uh, already closed on May 5th, so there's still a possibility that we can get in there, but we're going to we're going to negotiate with them. 
Um, so the Axiom Asia Fund, uh, we did fund number one. It's uh, it looks you know, very good uh, prospects on that fund. Uh, they come back. They came back to market for fund two, um, and uh, we wanted to do ten million. I'm not sure we can make it yet, but we'll see. We'll talk to them. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about both of these at the same time because of what happened. So I'll get to that in a second. The Opportunities Fund is a new fund that focuses on secondaries. And that fund is new and smaller, so there's plenty of opportunity to get into that. Um, quite honestly, uh, the flagship fund is also where we want to be. It's not on here. It'll be in, it'll be in market in the next couple of years. And um, I'm trying to develop a relationship with these folks, just like we did with Greenspring, so we can get the allocation we want. When I first met them, when we were introduced to them by Summit, uh, they were already uh, had the money they needed. They had said they said we have like ten million dollars. Do you want it? I said you know ten million dollars doesn't really do anything for at the time we're a two point five billion dollar fund. So they squeezed us in for twenty million dollars, and then the next time around they gave us forty. And um, instead of going out and partnering with other people to do the same thing, it'd be just a lot more efficient for us to do more of a, uh, with this group because they are a top tier group. So participating in these investments is partly a negotiating way of saying, hey, look, I'll support your other funds. You know, we need how much exposure can you give me in your next fund? So that's why I'm asking that uh, you approve a uh, 20 million commitment in total between the two funds. And we will work with them on how much we get from the fund that's already closed and how much we get in the in the uh, new fund. Um, and that's the basically uh, what we're asking for today. Um, if you want us to, we can bring up the data. I printed, we printed the reports for you. Uh, yes, these are the two funds we addressed. Yes, these are the same two funds we addressed at the last meeting, and uh, there was some concern about the strategy and uh, and doing them. So we wanted to revisit that and answer any questions that you had. So, um, at the last engineering meeting, you mentioned that you had some concerns about the investment as I was about the manager. Yeah. Speak a little bit about that. The management of the fund, and in, in what respect do you mean? Yeah, so so um, this is a growing firm. Uh, uh, I, uh, let's see, I can. So I have the 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 deck in front of you. If you want to look at it and look at. This is a growing firm, and uh, they've had they had some of the founding members. One of them was more like the the guy that bought the money in the door, so to speak, left the firm, and so that gave them an opportunity to bring in a lot of new people. But everybody that I dealt with from day one, uh, except for that one individual, which I did meet one time, uh, is still at the firm, but they are bringing in more people and they want to focus on the secondaries and the co-investment. So they have hired a lot of women, they've hired a lot of Asian people on the, on, in Singapore, as well as uh, uh, on the mainland, and they have even a presence in Taiwan. So it's a growing firm. They, they, when we met them, they had one fund, um, and it was the flagship fund. That was only one fund. And they came out, they were on fund number three by the time we met them. Today, they have, that fund is on number six, and they have three funds, three other funds. We're looking at two of them right here, and then, actually, so yes, there are new people, and there's a, there's a, but they are actually, uh, uh, a very sought after team in Asia. As a matter of fact, one of the largest Japanese firms that invests in private equity, not sorry, not Japanese, Korean firms. Uh, yeah, yeah, they are in Singapore, yes, but a, a Korean firm that's very high, uh, very heavily invested in real estate all over, uh, all over uh, Asia, and just took a 20% stake in the firm and they want them to handle their private equity investment so they will be coming into our funds as well so there's going to be competition to get into these funds but i do agree there are a lot of new people uh especially in the mid-level so let me just keep talking No. Um, yeah. Any questions you have? Okay.
Yes, the investments were both. And Keith, uh, please uh, feel free to chime in. Um, uh, I will turn, uh, we have you on camera up top so they can actually okay. see you in front of them. Uh, I'm gonna move on to, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll introduce this and let you take care, uh, take care of it. The um, uh, Centerbridge uh, Partners uh, is a real estate fund. Um, so um, you, Centerbridge is a familiar name to you because uh, we do their private equity fund. Uh, we uh, did fund number two, and if you recall, fund number two had some challenges, and uh, but the firm has a very reputable name, so we sold it uh, in the secondary market, and we actually ended up with more of a higher return than the real fund. We ended up with 110% of our money. The fund finished at 95% of people's money. But uh, because of that experience with that fund, uh, 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 the, the firm uh, really uh, had to kind of refocus and did a lot of soul searching. And I've been going to their every single annual meeting, including the remote one that they had this year, but I've been going to their annual meetings in New York. And they have done a phenomenal job with that, with that series of fund, the private equity fund. And they never had an issue on the real estate side. And um, it just so happened that uh, we know Center Bridge and I was told that um, NEPC was vetting them for a real estate fund, and it's a best idea for NEPC. So when those two things come together, I have to kind of take a look because, one, I don't have to add a new name to manage, and two, it's a best idea, and we are looking for to, to uh, uh, add to our real estate portfolio, uh, hopefully positive things to the real estate portfolio, the real asset portfolio, so that we can uh, fix our returns there. So we're recommending 30 million to the Centerbridge Real Estate Fund. They, this is more than fund too. They've done a lot of private uh, real estate on their platform through their other funds that they have, but this is the second dedicated real estate fund. And with that, I'll let I'll let Keith uh, 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 chime in if he wants to. And uh, the report is also in your stack. Yeah, just briefly, I think we could uh, just stay on this page. It's a pretty good summary. Um, you know, to Fadi's point, it's a best idea for us. So a rated one. Uh, we gave out the, I think it's a 23 plus page memo. Um, you know, so we're very familiar with them. You know, it is fun too for their dedicated real estate. They've over the years, I think 15 plus years, they've done almost 10 billion in real estate across their various funds. You know, generating about a 20% return and, you know, 1.5, 1.6 multiple. So they know what they're doing in the space, just kind of creating a dedicated vehicle here. Um, you know, so outside of the history, what we like is, um, you know, the first sentence talks about kind of that multi strategy approach that they're taking. So, depending on what the market presents, they could kind of move around. So, they may invest in loans and securities. So, publicly traded loans, think about REITs, uh, you know, in March, uh, those things were priced very low. So, they can take advantage of that. Um, they can get into corporate platforms. So, think about the Marriott's of the world or the, you know, the Great Wolf Lodges and COVID shut everything down. And, you know, they own a bunch of hotels and almost, you know, a large operating. Um, company and they need capital so things like that and they can also do direct investments in real estate so they can play in a, a lot of spaces across the across the board there uh, again deep team very experienced uh, been around for almost two decades um, you know happy to go through the memo but I think what you see here is a pretty good summary uh, of what's going on and again it's a, a top rated um, fund for us there's the memo right there what's your best guess what is your best guess in terms of the next couple of years whether or not the Loans and securities or the properties or the corporate platforms is going to do which one is going to do better, which one has will have challenges. Um, tricky question. <laughs> um, you know, the corporate platform, I think. 
think I think you see some of that. Some you know, the, 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 the you know the, the I guess the Marriott's are great with flyers, the Hyatt's. I think that the the depth of their capital needs was probably last March when we we started going into this and the economy shut down. So they got money not only from the government, um, but you know people with capital stepped in then. Um, so I'm I'm not sure you're gonna see a ton of uh, kind of that corporate platform uh, stuff. You may see some loans and securities. Again, people, there's going to be kind of people that come out of it pretty well. Some people are going to struggle. So, you know, if uh, there's some loans or securities out there that kind of take a hit, they may step into that it's kind of opportunistically. Um, and then I think direct real estate. So those two, I think, would probably be uh, the larger of the, the allocations and where the, the best um, best returns are they talked about. Or the memo here talks about a um, you know an example where they went into Boston. They bought kind of this giant industrial property. Um, I think uh, I think it was one of the uh, air carriers or freight carriers, uh, not FedEx, but I'm trying to think of the other one. But they were in there and they decided, hey, this is a great property that can be rezoned for retail and condos and you know apartments to like and, and make a lot more money. So they went in. Kind of worked on the zone and got the building ready uh, for that purpose. Helped the current tenant move out, find a new space, and then they sold it for you know two, three x. So I think things like that will probably be a bigger portion uh, of the portfolio. But you can see in the summary up top again. They've you know they've done nine, ten, nine to ten billion dollars of real estate over the years. Um, this is just kind of the dedicated fund too. They do some real estate and credit funds and their private equity funds. Uh, I think the demand was there for them to, uh, you know, do a dedicated real estate. They're predicting, you know, 16% returns, 15, 16, and then, you know, kind of like a one, one and a half X. And there's the, you know, the track record I talked about. So I don't, you know, Christine, I don't think you're going to see there's distress out there, but I think the biggest corporate platform of distress, we've, I think we've seen a lot of that already. Um, so we'll see. It's one of one of the nice things about working with a team like that that's been in real estate doing multiple sectors of real estate is that they have good sourcing from across all of those. So they will get the you know, the opportunities and compare them to each other. So we don't know exactly what the opportunity is going to look like going forward. I, I believe that because of COVID and, and some of the debt issues, there will be some issues in the space. A lot of properties are going to have to be repositioned. And uh, but we don't know what normal is going to look like yet. Uh, some of these cities, and Nashville is pretty much set. We know what's happening here. But if you go to New York and other places, they're still trying to figure it out. So there will be some opportunities, I think. And that's the reason we wanted to do this with a team that can go all the way up and down the capital structure. I have one um, question. Under the negatives um, in the second paragraph, Bridge has done a good job managing these investments. A continued recovery will be critical to the ultimate return of the profile. How concerned or how do you reconcile in your mind that these continued recoveries, which will be critical to the ultimate return of the profile, does that concern you or you feel that they have addressed that as well as they've done the policies and the other things? No, I, I think they've done a phenomenal job. Uh, one of the senior partners that founded the firm. Uh, decided to retire. Uh, he came from Angela Gordon, and instead of taking his equity position with him and making these guys pay him for years to come, he simply turned it over to the new team so that the new talent can come in. And it's become a very, very strong team because of that and very highly motivated team. We don't see that a lot in this industry. So I really, really like what the what the firm did. And you can tell uh, when you when you join their meetings, that they're enthusiastic and and the best part about it is that they also uh, are very good open in, with their investors. I I spoke to them about fund number two and they were very honest with me about what's going on and they didn't try to sugarcoat anything and that's what enabled me to make the decision that hey I could really get some money for this because everybody else loves this firm. And uh, then when they launched the next fund, I just saw a phenomenal. It was like, I, these guys are doing a great job. We want to be part of this team. So I, th I think it's a good partnership. Um, but uh, like with anything else, we don't know till it comes to an end, right? But we try to evaluate based on very subjective measures. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Yeah. Motion to approve the second paragraph of the second paragraph. Second. 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 Session if you want to ask. Excuse 
everything that So that people can yeah. that people can think that the investment is not right. So that's the investment. So you mean on the private equity discussion a couple of things. So always welcome to just chime in and just change it. Okay, so any other discussion at all? What's next? The four fifty seven. The target day plan. So what? The target yeah, plan. Target. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to let NPC do this, but I want to introduce the, the the metro part of it. So we have a four fifty seven plan that's really the purview of the benefit board, uh, but because you guys are more into investments and they are they they've asked us to do this for them so you will be reviewing this recommendation that NEPC has based on you asking us to do a search to replace the target date funds in the 457 metro max plan but your vote to, today will will mean will be direction to us to take it to the benefit board where you will see it again and you will then be asked by your peers why you're doing this. I'll be there. And that's the process because we're, we don't have the ability to invest that for those funds. We're simply doing an investment function for them. Um, with that said, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dan. You're with us. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Buddy? Yeah. And uh, Paul, can you give uh, Dan the ability to uh, sh scroll through his slide, make him the presenter or do I need to do that? He's got it now. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so. As Fadi mentioned, uh, the, the DC plan has a, a target date fund that's underperformed. Can, uh, the, the Wells Fargo fund is, has been. Uh, can you make that? Can, sorry, can you make that bigger? Um, a couple of clicks at least. Sure. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna see what we're doing here, and I can maximize it, right? A little bit more. Uh, sorry, I went full screen. That didn't work. Go. Uh, that better? How's that, guys? Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so Wells seen, Fargo. Did we print this? No, this is like 127 pages. We did not print it, but we'll be happy. Yes, yeah. it's in the data Windows down the bottom. Yeah, what, what's that happening, Bob? Hey, Dan, you got like two of your PDFs kind of hanging around there. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to. Uh, let me fix that if I can. That was on my computer. That was on my computer. All right, let me. Uh, I'm going to reopen it. Sorry. All right, that's fine. Thank you. How's that? Is that? Can you see that? Okay. No, no, let's see the. Let's see the small print. Yeah, that's there you go. That's good. We, we do have video. Okay. Uh, so just to, to recap, Wells Fargo has underperformed consistently the last uh, few years and trailing periods. Uh, they're a defensive manager, so there is some headwinds to that. Uh, they also have some factors that have, have hurt their performance relative to others and value till. Uh, so what we did is we went and did a search for defensive style target date managers. We talked about this last quarter. Um, also in that time, Wells Fargo sold their asset management division. So at the firm level, they've been placed on watch and NEPC. Um, so with this search, we, we've identified six candidates uh, and the recommendation here is for Vanguard. Vanguard, uh, in terms of timing, it's actually been pretty 
pretty good timing to do a search because they just recently reduced the minimum for the institutional share class. So that gives the opportunity for investment in a, a nine basis point share class. Uh, the, the fund today is at 14 basis points, which is already fairly cheap. But now uh, making the change here, we get the benefit of the fee savings as well. Uh, Vanguard is, as you may know, is the, is the index provider within the plan. So there's three index funds in the plan already from Vanguard. So from a firm perspective, there's a, a comfort level there and, and familiarity for the, the, the participants within the plan already. Uh, just some other topics just to hit on. Vanguard's supply path is similar to, to Wells Fargo uh, in terms of there are three managers, so they, they manage after retirement. The glide path extends after the retirement date. Um, Wells Fargo goes out 10 years. Vanguard is just short of that at seven years. Uh, but they have a similar landing spot of their glide path. So they go to 30% equity. Uh, so there's no change there in terms of what participants will see uh, after retirement and when the glide path ends. So there is some comfort level there that it isn't as much of a disruption on the glide path side. And Vanguard, is, frankly, is a simpler structure. Uh, it's an index, uh, six underlying asset classes, pretty broad based, uh, easy to understand for participants who are investing. Uh, we have some other slides. I know uh, that the committee has, uh, I don't know if they're, they're printed, so uh, just to give you a sense of the other managers, really the fit here is, is trying to balance fees, you're trying to balance glide path and performance. So Vanguard is, is probably not going to be the, the best performer every quarter uh, in the category. They're going to run a little bit more in the middle, which you know, for DC plans and, and taking out some of that relative volatility is probably a good thing, and a little more of a smoother ride. Uh, in terms of the rank I see from Vanguard versus these two with, with Wells Fargo. So, Dan, these were the other five that you considered? Yes, these are the preferred managers in APC. So, uh, we cut, we, I put some comments for each one just to, to make note of why how they're different from the current provider and then, uh, you know, relative to Vanguard, why we think Vanguard is a better company. And I assume you've done the search for other clients as well. Yes, these are so these managers are the ones that we would take to any client um, that is looking for a target date manager, whether a new opportunity or or one to replace an existing. Manager. So this is this is actually their target list with six, so you can pick anyone you want because they're all. Yeah. Who would you, for example, target for target date manager? State Street for. So State Street is actually pretty close to Vanguard when you look at the comparison. Uh, State Street, they're, they're glad to have, I guess, the, the one thing that's different than uh, Vanguard is they, they land at 35. Uh, and then also their glad path is, is a five year roll down after retirement, so a little bit shorter uh, than it, it basically cuts the Wells Fargo glad path in half. And then they also have some exposure to some other asset class, high yield commodities and REITs, and then they do have a long bond allocation. So that's a little bit of a, a different uh, flavor target, a little more, a little more eclectic, and, and you, know, you could get some volatility and really, uh, you know, underperformance in those asset classes that you wouldn't necessarily see. But in your last 10 searches for clients, have you, has it been fairly, have you used all six of these for, for at least one of them, or used one of these for one of those? You know, I'm saying are you, are you consistently recommending Vanguard to people or are you recommending each of these for specific types of, of uh, plans? Yeah, so, yeah, so I would say Vanguard has probably been leading the way just for, for the simplicity. Uh, State Street is, is, is for somebody that wants a little bit more diversity in, in, in access to some other asset classes, but Vanguard, in terms of recommendation, uh, me personally, I haven't recommended target dates. It's been pretty, pretty low uh, search volume these last few quarters. I mean, you're the only exposure we have to Wells Fargo. So, um, if we were going to have another client, Vanguard would probably be one of the the firms we would recommend. Well, I want to mention one thing that did change is that uh, Vanguard used to have a fifty million dollar minimum target date target date funds assets before you can select them. Yeah. And so that was not an option to us before, but they recently dropped that. And I think we are now at 40 million. So it, it became an option where in the past it was not. 
Yeah, that, I'm sorry. I, I tried to make that point earlier. I didn't, might not have driven that home. The Vanguard, so the, the old share class you would have been able to get access to would have been anywhere from 12 to 15 basis points. So in some cases, the fee would have gone up for, for participants if, if you went to Vanguard at any time. So a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm looking in the mirror myself and just saying that I wish we would have been a little bit lighter on our feet and done this quicker. Um, because most well, likely it's not the minimum. <laughs> this is not something new. I think we could have, I think we could have made an adjustment quicker. But again, I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And then the other thing is when we do present this to our, the rest of the board, um, I think we need to very clearly formulate a chart that talks about the cost of Wells Fargo versus Vanguard, the, maybe the performance. You guys know the categories. Can you bring that up in your? Anticipate in terms of performance or anticipate in terms of like what a glide path is. I mean, I don't think we should assume that. I, I don't think we should just dump this as if they know because that really makes people feel really anxious. Um, so something very clear and simple. Um, and again, I wish we would have done this. And I think I think Dan has that. Uh, uh, we can. Uh, he just uh, didn't go through it, but uh, he has a very good explanation of of the various. Um, uh, but you're right. Uh, the, it is a complicated issue. And when when uh, Dan sent me this, I had like three four questions for him, uh, and it took days to handle. So it's not a it's not a light topic. Uh, the bottom line is that <clears throat> there's a little bit of bias, and no matter what we do. Um, I, you know, if you want to look in the mirror, I'm not removing Wells Fargo sooner. I probably should look in the mirror more than anybody, but um, I'm, I'm not a, you know, to, generally speaking, I'm not an alpha chaser. In my experience, you replace somebody and then uh, there's no guarantee that who you replace them is going to do better. What pulled the trigger for me was the sale of Wells Fargo sold that division. So to me, it just became more more feasible to to take that, and then the Vanguard opportunity came around. And um, to be honest with you, the the bias we have, and and you know, it is a bias, is that so these these target date funds can be risky with some providers, and then when the market goes down, yet we're telling retirees that hey, if you invest a certain way, you'll be fine, which is which is a little bit problematic for me. We used to have like an option where people would have conservative, moderately aggressive, or that's that's now gone to target date. So we 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 have a bias towards these um, uh, sort of safer glide paths. And it tends to mimic really the the risk qualities of our of our employees. And if you don't like that, you can create your own guide path by by either picking a a later retirement date than your own, or by picking the individual funds that we have in the plan. So uh, I don't know if this will be the best performing funds going forward. I mean, if 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 stocks continue to be on a upward, you know, and and whatever, I know it's a responsible way to do it. And that's really what I'm recommending. I can't, rec I don't know what the returns are, but we will not put up with somebody underperforming for the wrong reason, meaning they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So we're not just, you know, agnostic to that. Obviously, we're going to monitor them and expect results, but, you know, um, it is an index fund. What, what did you I'm sorry, I mean, what is it so this so right now they're in the Wells Fargo funds and what happens in the full detailed vote that the benefit board will have there will be an explanation a chart that uh, Voya will prepare as to how each fund will be mapped to the other fund so and they'll get a letter and they'll have a time deadline before the, the employees will get a letter saying if you don't like this you want to pick the other funds do so before such and that date on midnight such and such date we will make a switch so it'll be a detailed letter that the board will approve uh prior to it going up and it, yeah yeah yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we always so we normally take this. Forty million, forty million in various funds. Sorry. So we normally take this to the study session, 
of the benefit board and engage kind of what the what the concerns are, what the questions are, and what they want more or less. And then we bring it to a vote. And normally when it's brought up to the vote, there's been times where I wasn't even there because they didn't want anything else. But that's the process. We'll go to the education session and we'll have a little more time to talk about it. And does not mean that that's the last time we'll go to education session if there's more information that's needed. So and I'll, I'll invite Dan as well to to come in. Hopefully by then they'll be traveling. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> Man, I said that note there. I think slide four is pretty good on a glide path, just kind of through and two. Yeah, and... sorry, I, I was gonna jump there. Um if we want to just yeah, take go a ahead. Yeah, let's do that so that uh Christine and the other board members can kind of see what they're gonna show their peers. Yeah, so the the glide path for the candidates you can see on the page here, and the starting point for Vanguard is similar to Fidelity, where oh, sorry, uh, Wells Fargo, where you're at 90% equity, uh, and then at, at retirement we show where the glide path is in terms of equity percentage. Vanguard's at 50, Wells Fargo's at 42, so slight difference there. But the roll down period for Vanguard to get to that ending 30% landing is seven years, where Wells Fargo's 10. So. So Dan, for what for what retirement frame is this? What are you using for your benchmark retirement? Uh, this is it. Retirement date is sixty five. So, assuming age sixty five is retirement date for for the participant, this is where they're for somebody that's right. Okay, I got it. So last ten years. Ten years, in other words, ten years. I'm wondering, like, which step in the So this is this is the overall glad pass. So we're not using any particular fund here. This is just oh, how a specific. Each, okay. This is how each fund will go. So 2025 uh, fund is is three years away from uh, retire. Well, actually, it's four years away. Sorry. Okay. So this right is now. the 2025 retirement. This is the whole glad pass. So. So it's not the 2025. No, somebody. So if you when you start out, it's going to be ninety percent. You're going to end up at thirty. So okay, I think got it. So you're okay. I was so, confused to what what the two were. Okay. Twenty twenty five, so, probably forty percent equity or plus or minus in there, almost towards that thirty point end okay. point. So when somebody got retired, it. they're still going to have thirty percent equity. Okay. They're going to start out with ninety. By the time they retire, they're, they're going to end up at thirty. Maybe that was clear to everybody else, but it wasn't clear to me. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> This is a great chart that shows why you chose Vanguard. This is not such a great chart that shows why, for an individual who's now in Starbucks, why they are getting it. Sorry, I, can you just can you yeah, no, I, I, so, so that's fine. I understand. So, so bottom line is that uh, Wells Fargo is is more expensive. Okay. And for the expense that we were paying, it wasn't really providing an added benefit. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what, what Dan is doing here is he's assuming that you guys already came to that conclusion. That's why you asked him to do the search. So, our bad, we're, we're taking it from the selection process, not the why we're firing them. So, uh, that this, we did this at the last, last time, but the bottom line is that, um, they 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 went and sold them sold that division, and um, not big fans of that um, as a general rule. Um, they just kind of accumulate assets and sell us on so you can monetize that. Uh, they weren't performing well, um, even for their benchmark and and account uh, adjusting for the conservative nature of the funds. It just wasn't working well, and it was primarily due to the value bias of the portfolio. Granted, that's why we were patient because value had not done very, very well in a long time. But then all of a sudden came this opportunity to invest in a Vanguard fund at a lower fee, where before we could not. Those are the reasons that you voted to make the change, and now it's just a matter of who. So we will have to cover both with the with the benefit board. I well noted. I do. I do agree. And and uh, so so that's a sorry.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, these things that. Yeah, I mean, these things are not, when you replace a mutual fund, this is essentially what we're doing here. It's not like it is a failure or that there's going to be millions of retirees still with Wells Fargo after we leave. It's just a, a choice that we're making based on the information we have and the fact that they were sold and they hadn't done well. And again, another important point is that we, we want to be careful not to go pick somebody that's done well because they emphasized growth stocks and then come in at the very end of the, the growth stock rally and suffer the benefit, the, the, the consequence going forward. So we're trying to pick somebody that's along the same lines, that's still conservative. Uh, there is a little bit of a less active management in this, even though Wells Fargo was an index, they had the ability to increase those ranges for equity exposure up or down 5%. So Vanguard is more, more, more stringent than that. They don't fluctuate. But the, the, other than that, they're very similar. Lower fees, though, that's the main thing. That's guaranteed increased value. Do we need to take a budget to get to put this in front of the Yeah, we need a vote to move it on to the benefit board. I don't think that's the question. I'll make that motion to get this to the benefit board. It's the main guard charge. Is it a high? A second. Thank you. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the contracts. You can see what happened here during the quarter. I will bring up that we've been in contact with all of you, and it seems like August 5th is going to be a good date for all of you and um, any PC to do the ESG and fiduciary training that uh, that, that uh, you guys asked for at the last meeting we had. So uh, Caitlin will be sending a uh, a reminder. That meeting will be will be a committee meeting because you guys are there by law. Uh, but we will not be voting on anything. We're going to show you some stuff like proposed language for the investment policy, uh, and and but it will be a lunch and we will have it upstairs. Uh, past our offices at the end of the hall in the Office of Management and Budget. So uh, we look forward to that. Uh, uh, NEPC's uh, ex expert on this area is going to join us. And, uh, um, and I think uh, Margaret and Josh possibly. August 5th. Sorry? August 5th. August 5th, yeah. We're sending you the, it's 11.30 and we're going to schedule about, a, about an hour and, hour and a half. Uh, normally we don't start on time, so as soon as you, as soon as everybody's there, we start, and uh, hopefully we'll give you enough time to speak to the the, the person that's coming from NEPC before and after, and uh, and even talk about the proposed language and what it means and so on and so forth. So we'll work on that. The goal of the meeting is to provide you with an understanding of ESG and some of the choices you have and some of the restrictions you have as a government entity. And any other goal you want to have to the meeting, please email us. We will make it a top priority. Michelle, did I say that right? We're going to review ESG, see what choices they have, possibly have language for the investment policy, maybe. So that's basically it. But it's really your meeting. You asked for it. You're just kind of trying to make it. It will be a public. And, and, you know, we're going to try to sparse out the E, the S, and the G separately, what, what we want to have, and have a policy written for that. And then you can say, well, I don't like that. You're going to rely on the manager to do this, or you're going to have NEPC do that, whatever. So I'm going to reflect essentially what we're doing, okay, with the idea of what you guys have seemed to be wanting to do. But please, your priorities, whatever you have, say, hey, I wanted to do this. Can it do that? But that's part of the reason why NEPC is there is to kind of guide us through that process. Okay, so we go to the agenda. 
And uh, we're done with uh, with all items number three, so we're going to turn our attention to. Um, and uh, Paul, can you make uh, Keith the presenter so he can present the report? And Michelle, Michelle, do you want to talk about this? I don't know if Paul heard me, but yeah, he's got it. Okay, yep. he's got it. Um, okay, so just to be clear, we're under uh, the item number four. Correct. Michelle, just give me one second. I got to pull it up on my screen. And so we we changed up the order of agenda recently because. Um, short on time for our recommendation, but I'm about to make our important So um, we're leaving on purpose the review of the pension report. Um, we'll go over the report, but, you know, in general, we, we had a really great month uh, quarter, particularly in March. Um, it was a great month, um, and it was actually across the whole portfolio mark. Um, which is pretty uh, kind of a big token for us. And uh, Friday for some very important now we're getting out. So, yeah, we'll, we'll just let Keith go over the report and. Why well, is it not present already? Keith? Yeah, I'm driving. Right. Sorry, it's okay. my fault. We ready? <laughs> can I make that big? Uh, you can close out that panelist list. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Um, so I think we're, we're running a little bit late. Um, so again, just quickly on the, the uh, market overview. So again, strong quarter. You can see on the, the right hand side equities. Um, you know the benefit of that. So you know continued um, positive momentum based on the vaccinations. Uh, you know economies around the globe starting to uh, open up. Uh, you know, particularly US, uh, you know, China, Europe a little bit behind. Uh, some areas are still having some trouble there, but in general, uh, certainly positive momentum. There you can see the US SP 500 up 6.2, EFI, so kind of developed, uh, you know, Europe, Australia, Far East, and then emerging markets up 2.3%. So positive across the board. You know, a good bit of capital coming into the US. We're expecting that very strong growth. Um, you know, so. Money flowing into equities, money was flowing into our bonds there. You can see the dollar up 3.7%. So that kind of muted some of these non US returns. So anytime they're directly back to dollars, um, you know, that could be a, a negative if the dollar is not uh, strong there. Uh, interest rates for those that follow, we were, I think, around 0.6. We're up to, uh, you know, 1.6. So historically, still very low, but we saw a pretty sharp move off, uh, uh, off the base, kind of brought us back to where we were uh, pre COVID. Um, so anytime rates go up, you know, that inverse relationship of bonds, you know, bond bond prices are going to take a hit and go down. So you, your traditional investment grade credit uh, mandate down 3.4%. Um, the good news is uh, the way your portfolio is structured, uh, we protect it pretty well, and you'll you'll see that in the results there. Um, and just real assets really flow through to your private markets. You know, oil's up, you know, 22%. It's kind of, you know, around 60, 65 now. So that's certainly going to flow through to to some of those uh, other investments. Can you, can you hang on just uh, a second? Uh, We're all trying to make sure we have the right dogs. That's... It was next to the last. Yeah, you can take it real well when you're uh, on, on Zoom. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can get that. No good. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I didn't hear you. <laughs> okay, yeah, page five. We all set? Yeah. Ready? Yes. Okay, sorry. It's hard to hear everybody else in the room. Just yeah, um, that's fine. Uh, but just stop. So again, really uh, positive, uh, positive for markets. Starting to see a little bit of noise now. Um, you know, last couple months, but you'll see translate a very good, very good quarter for the plan. Uh, and overall results still are very strong. Um, if there's no questions on this, I can move forward. <laughs> 
Yeah, sorry about that. Again, uh, I think Michelle might have mentioned. So this is the condensed 36 pager. We have the 100 plus that we normally produce. If you if you wanted to get some more details, um, you know, uh, funds about four billion dollars. So we, we've uh, added a lot of value over the the past few years. Up 152 for the quarter. Uh, policy wise, we're within range. Again, private equity is uh, over. We talked about it. Good performance. We've been kind of uh, walked that back a little bit, and you can see we've we've actually made a little little progress uh, on that front there. Um, a quick question: Our our assets are four billion. What is our lock? What are our abilities as far as we know right now? A little less than four billion. Okay, good. So we're over eight percent. Well, uh, so the, based on this report, we're probably right at a hundred because for other reasons. But uh, yeah, so. The plan is as of yesterday is over 4.2 billion, um, but that can come and go, you know, with the market. So. Yeah, right. so again, performance here, gross of fees, and then we'll shift gears to kind of a, uh, we'll show the net comparisons as well. But for the quarter, 5.2 second percent percentile against public funds. So again, 100 plus funds, you know, hundreds of funds out there. We're comparing you to um, one is the best, 100 is the worst. Uh, for the for the year, 92nd percentile still on an absolute basis, 27%. You're going to see some of these year over year numbers, particularly in the equity markets, are, are massive. Uh, anywhere from 50, 60 to up, upwards to almost 100% in small cap. So, again, lower equity profile relative to pairs. This makes sense. Three years, you're in the fourth percentile. Five years, six percentile. Again, 12 plus percent. So well ahead of your your target uh, rate of return there. Excuse me. Um, you know, fixed income alternatives we talked about here really drove drove the the returns on a relative basis, so relative to uh, their benchmarks. Um, you know, small cap uh, underperformed a little bit. So you have two managers there. You have uh, Blair and Champlain. Um, you know, if you follow the markets a little closely, we've we've seen value kind of snap back, and within that, the most beaten up uh, stocks, so lower quality type stuff, have had the biggest run. Uh, and your managers tend not to kind of play in play in that uh, that, that space there a little bit. Um, so. They were positive, just haven't kept up, kept up uh, with, the, with the returns. We noted that hedge funds here, I, I kind of muted, we're, we're, we've been rolling out of those, so performance is going to kind of wax and wane as that, that we liquidate through that, but we are almost done uh, with that process. Um, I talked about earlier, in general, fixed income was down almost 3.5%. Your exposure in that space outperformed by 2.8, so really protected as we've seen, and seen those rates uh, move up, and we'll, we'll see that on the next few pages. Thank you. Yep. That's Christine. So just a question, and maybe this is uh, a decision. I had, I had, I thought we had all kind of talked about at some point in the future, maybe doing a net of fees, the gross of fees. I wasn't sure where we were with that decision or that. Hi, uh, Mrs. Michelle. Yes, uh, we did go over that, and what we were are able to provide based on um, the information is that the reports that you have in front of you show that of fees on the charts, the looking charts. Okay. Um, when you're looking at the analytics and some of the statistical data that you see in some of the more fancy charts, that's gross because. Um, and and uh, uh, this report though is, is substantially reporting that matter of fact this page and some of the subsequent pages we're going to go over our net but uh, we will remind you if we go back and forth because there is some back and forth and uh, we'll try to address that in the future. But this page is net, correct, Keith? Yeah, so so the, the prior page I just showed was we showed the growth. So now we're gonna we're gonna move into net mostly the rest of this and then towards the, the back end is gonna be uh, gross as well. So it's a few reasons, um, naturally net. Uh, so not everybody reports uh, good net numbers. It's getting better as in the industry um, over time. So I think we'll show both here, um, but you're going to move around, but it's, it's sim same results. I mean, positive return. So for the three months, um, again, composite net of fees, 
4.4% relative to your policy. Your policy came in at 3.2. So you can see that kind of charted out here as well in the middle of the page. Your policy is the, um, the light green. Dark green is your actual results there. Your pair group net came in at 3.1%. So you outperformed your pair group 4.4 four versus 3.1. Um, you know, I know one year you're, you're towards the back end again, equities were super strong. You're going to see that in a minute. Uh, we talked about in the past, whenever equities are really up, you're going to lag on a rank basis. Um, your returns are still strong when equities are way down. You're going to look great over time. Your position is played out and you can see this, you know, 10 plus percent returns over the three and five year, you're ranking kind of top third percentile. And as you go out longer, uh, you know, 10 years, you got 9%, your peer group's at eight. So you're picking up 1% relative to your peer group net of fees uh, over a 10 year period, it puts you kind of 13th there. And you can see all those uh, on a trailing period. So as of March, and then also on, on a calendar year basis. We um, put this in here, it's a lot of information. Um, essentially what we're doing is setting up kind of where the benefits uh, from the plan have been drawn and you can see kind of allocation effect and selection effect. So uh, allocation is essentially how you allocated your funds. Um, and you can see, uh, we'll take private equity for example. So your overweight private equity, private equity was one of the better performing assets. So the fact that you're overweight plus you're in a, a good performing asset, that's a positive allocation effect there and then selection is kind of how you done how did you do within those those asset classes so fixed income uh would be kind of a positive result on selections um you know private equity again because you have a lot of it, it's positive relative to the benchmark this quarter you were down uh relative to the bench so that's kind of a detractor in selections um or uh, selection effect so can get and we just thought this is a good way to kind of see what's what's adding value or, or not uh, graphically. And Keith, this is Tom. With private equity, I mean, uh, fixed income as well is kind of a trailing quarter. Is that correct? For the most part, yeah, yeah. kind of a lag there. Please, right. Uh, I'd say two things. Yeah, they're, the values are lag. That's kind of industry standard. Two, when we're looking at these charts, we're comparing them to public market benchmarks. Yeah. So um, that you, you'll see a lot of noise there. You know, markets were up, so naturally you wouldn't expect your private equity to, to keep up on a quarterly basis. Over time, it's it's done amazing. Uh, and similar to, to fixed income as well. Um, so that's a three year. If you look broader, just kind of policy relative to target. Um, so on the bottom are the numbers up top is kind of over under. Um, so you can see domestic equity target is 25. Again, a lot of that is because we took, um, took a lot away from that. We took the 7% um, that we had at hedge funds and we eliminated that and kind of essentially bumped a lot of that up into the domestic equity. International pretty much in line. I talked about equity hedge. So we have a little bit left kind of unwinding that should be done you know, over the, the following few quarters. And then you can see the rest of them, fixed income, all regular fixed income, real assets, uh, and so forth uh, on that front. You know, you can see private equity has come down a little bit. If you look to the right, uh, you know, 2020, we're at 23.2, we're now 22.7. Um, you know, fixed income alts is coming down as well. So we're, we're making progress. It's, you know, a good problem to have is the performance has been so strong that it hasn't come down that much. I talked about the ranks in your position relative to your peers. You can see you're running about 18 and a half percent equity. The median for public funds out there, 30.6 percent, and we're looking at 110 um, public funds here. So you, you know, you're well below. You're towards basically the bottom as far as equity. So when equities are really strong, that's going to affect your your ranks. Uh, you still have good good returns there. And you can see to the right hand side, you're kind of overweight in private equity, um, you know, and fixed income alternatives. This is, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise. This is something we talk about every, every quarter. Um, you know, returns are great, but what kind of, what kind of risk are you putting on the table? Uh, the crosshair charts, so the crosshairs are the median. The risk is across the X axis. The return is on the Y axis. Um, you know, the shaded area is kind of one standard deviation plus or minus there. All these blue dots represent the universe. The green square is where you are. So you are in the perfect spot. You want to be upper left, which means you're taking on less risk and generating more return. So that's the three number. 
If you come down the bottom, you can see the numbers. So your return is top third. Your risk is first. So you're putting on a lot. You know, your average peer group is 11.7. Now, granted, private markets are kind of muting that a little bit because um, you know they're not as volatile. They don't price there. But, but in general, for the risk you're taking out, so that sharp ratio, what type of return you're generating per unit of risk, you're first, and you're well ahead of your your peer group there. So that's the three years, the five years, etc. So returns are strong. Uh, the risk adjusted returns uh, are also strong relative to peers. Composite um, level we talked about. If you come down into the, the page a little bit more, total domestic equity, again, behind for the, the quarter, we show the fiscal year to date, and then we show the one year year ahead here. This is mostly Blair and uh, Champlain, uh, Champlain Invest, uh, Advisors. Again, quality investors, what's rallied the most is kind of low quality, and we'll peek at that in, in a page or two. I'm going to skip the hedge funds again. We, we've come from 7% down to 1.4, so you're going to see a lot of noise as they kind of unwind out there. Um, fixed income in general, benchmark was down 3.4. Uh, again, interest rates moved up. That's negative. You can see year overall fixed income was down just 60 basis points. Uh, Fiscal year to date is a 5.8 versus minus 2.1. So you're outperforming by eight points uh, fiscal year to date and then by 11 points uh, kind of the one year period. So we've we've been through a lot uh, relative to, uh, you know, where we were COVID kind of a year out now. So performing very well in a space that's becoming uh, very volatile. Fixed income alts. Again, 47 relative to the benchmark here is the high yield index. Uh, so you see you're outperforming very well on a quarterly basis, the year to date, fiscal year to date. The one year, high yield's up 23%. So we're coming off a very low base, you know, March 2020 at, at the heart of, the, heart of the, the pandemic. Uh, one year later, certainly, certainly recoveries. You can see over time, you know, we've added value 10 years. You've added almost three points relative to that public market benchmark. Real assets again starting to approve. Energy is starting to perk up, uh, so we expect to, to see some improvement there. So you see that in the quarter in the fiscal year to date, still a little lagging uh, over the the one year period there. And then private equity, again, you're going against a public equity benchmark, so you're going to look bad now when equities are really good. You're going to look really great when equities are, are bad. But in longer term, you could see here, 16% a year versus just let's call it 12. Um, so four points on average per year uh, outperforming the public markets. Any questions Any on this? Questions? Not going to spend a ton of time here. I just want to point it out. So, um, you know, Champlain and Blair, I talked about the equities, kind of the laggards there. And you can see they're up 67%. So they had a great year on an absolute basis. The bench was up 73. Uh, you know, in Champlain's case, in Blair's case, the, the benchmark is up 90% year over year. So great returns on an absolute basis on a relative compared to the benchmark lagging. Again, some of those names that really got beat up, kind of rallied the most, they're not in that space. You can see longer term, you know, they're two, three, four points ahead of the benchmark. Uh, so no concerns, uh, no concerns on that front here. And I'll just show you a fixed income really quick. You know, the bulk of your fixed income is in kind of corporate credit and unconstrained. So PIMCO could kind of go anywhere, do anything, kind of really play with that uh, duration profile there. You can see both of these buckets outperforming by a lot uh, over the, the past one year period and, and in longer term there. So adding value both on the fixed income side, traditional plus on the, the, uh, the private side of things. I'll scroll ahead and show you the page. So page 22, we put kind of the, the summary here. Fadi talked about the numbers uh, early on there. Uh, so up top, we go, we have fixed income, then we go private equity, then we go real estate and real assets. And then the, the last line item here is the total. Uh, to the right-hand side, we show a few things. TBPI, so that's total value to pay it in. So every dollar you put in, how much have you gotten back so far? We show a return, and then we show what's called a public market equivalent, so PME. So in fixed income alternative space, so far every dollar you put out, you've gotten back a dollar twenty-seven in value. You've averaged just shy of a nine percent return. Um, if you had put dollar for dollar, same dates, same everything into that kind of BC ag, so traditional markets, you would have had a 3.8% return. So 5% gap there uh, relative between private and public. 
uh, you know, private equity, same exercise. You're almost getting two dollars to one dollar that you put in there in value. So you know, one ninety nine. So that's an extremely strong multiple. Just shy. You know, you're at seventeen percent uh, returns. If you did the same thing dollar for dollar in public markets, you would have got thirteen percent. So again, good gap. That's what you want to see. You're locking up your capital. You should get paid a, a liquidity premium there. Um, and in real estate and real assets, a little lower, but just shy one and a half. Uh, you know, eight, call it 8% IRR. We're showing it versus a Russell 3000. So this is an equity benchmark. We have a lot of different things in real estate and real assets, um, but not a good PME otherwise to compare to. So not apples to apples, but, you know, certainly uh, pretty close to an uh, all equity benchmark there. And then just overall, uh, you know, Fadi talked about it. So over the years, you committed to call it 3.7 billion. Uh, you know, your total value on that 3.7 that, or, what you've paid in is 2.8. You've generated a dollar 53 for every dollar you put in there. 11% uh, return over time. If you did uh, all that money in traditional, said ignore the privates, you would have had a 9% return. So again, 2% relative uh, outperformance relative to the markets. So super strong uh, performance across these areas. So let me pause there. If there's no questions, I think we should move on. I think they're okay. Good. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to go over the tables at the end. I'll do. I'll focus in on that at the next meeting. So we'll, so we'll have a whole month. But in, in the interest of time, uh, we'll turn over to Dan. Uh, and Paul, can you make? Sorry, <laughs> we're done with Dan, right? No, you need Dan for the. Well, so we 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 need Dan to present. Paul, can you make Dan the presenter so he can turn up, uh, bring up the four fifty seven performance. He's got the ball. All right. All right. So I yeah. will. Uh, I'll hit the main points here because I know we're short on time. Uh, did want to just point out that we talked about the the Wells Fargo announcement. That's in the book here uh, on uh, slide six. It just gives the the. Summary of what happened with Wells Fargo and the firm uh, being sold, and then that it's been placed on watch by our research group. So that is in your quarterly materials, just for, for your reference. Uh, jumping forward to performance, I know uh, we, we talked about target dates, Wells Fargo, uh, their near dated funds uh, were negative, and as you go further out on the glide path, uh, you know, the longer dated funds. You can see better relative performance versus peers. The ranks improve. Part of that is their their value tilt. So we talked about how they tilt towards value and value on the equity side uh, had a bit of a comeback versus growth in, in the first quarter. So um, that's that's fueled their their better performance on the longer dated side. But still, as we as we mentioned, uh, trailing performance as three, five, and ten years. You can see uh, you know, the ranks of the years uh, is the bottom quartile. In terms of an absolute basis, though, when you look at the last year uh, from, from kind of the bottom of the market, you can see anywhere from 15.8 to 0.5% uh, return. So um, a strong uh, trailing year, it's been, uh, you know, through all the funds, especially. Um, and it's really been, you know, when they look at their, 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 their excuse me, seven balance, they'll, they'll probably see one of their highest balances they've seen uh, just from the, the market performance in this last year. Jumping forward to the core lineup, similar story on that last year. Uh, you can see positive performance across the board in that second column. Uh, did point out Vanguard Prime Cap. That's a fund that uh, at the beginning of 2020 underperformed with their allocation to some airline and travel stocks. Uh, they bounced back really well versus their growth peers. They're in the third quartile, uh, third, excuse me, third percentile top quartile performance, and they're up 10.1% versus the benchmark that was up. Uh, zero point nine. It's a really good bounce back for them uh, with the recovery in, in some of the sectors they were investing in. 
Find it one more page here and I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Uh, again, looking at the last year for the, the small mid cap stocks and then also the international stocks and real estate. Again, you see double digit returns. Obviously, that we've taken into the account the bottom of the market and how we've recovered since then. And, and the rally. Cap, you see, uh, boy, a small cap fund is at 83.2%. Uh, That's trailing their benchmark, actually, relative performance this last quarter. Uh, you may know the, the GME uh, GameStop uh, story where uh, the Wall Street bets, uh, they didn't own that, and, and that was the biggest source of their underperformance relative to peers. But uh, all in all, strong performance uh, on, on an absolute basis for plan funds. No other recommendations from going beyond the target. Any questions on the performance of You can move on. Okay. Is that it? John. That, 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 okay. That's it for me. All right. Thank you. We still put it off. Um, Okay, so I think what's left is uh, uh, to hear from Voya on their activity. Yes, thank you guys. I don't often like to let people touch my stuff, but I'm gonna let them. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is yours? Yeah. <laughs> Man, this computer could talk. Oh, great to be with y'all. Uh, thank you for your time today. I wanna share what uh, we've been up to in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, jump in. I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. Just to, it's been a, it's been a minute. Remind you all what we uh, what we look like. Delta was on earlier. Uh, I know she had to drop off. To, she had to go to a meeting. She's down in in Houston. But you have myself here in Nashville, and you have the local team, Wit, Lisa, and Seth, holding down the fort over at the Washington Square building. Uh, I'm going to hit on. Um, Local activity, we did zero out uh, across uh, all four quarters finally on site visits due to social distancing recommendations. Uh, but call ins were up, walk ins uh, were kind of hit, hit and miss. Um, but the cumulative number of attendees, it's okay for, for what it is. We know there's a lot of pent up demand out there, and we cannot wait to get back out in the field. Enrollments uh, rebounded nicely in uh, first quarter. We had some enthusiastic participation with police and fire and and uh, DCSO. They always do a good good job for us. Very enthusiastic. I will point out that the COVID related distributions ended on December 31st. You see in that third line there. Uh, so that's why we didn't have anything in Q1. The cumulative total there 195 COVID related distributions for 1.8. Million. There were some rollovers and drops that come in on a rolling 12. We're looking, we bring in typically between seven and ten million dollars annually just in rollovers from outside plans and also within the pension dollars from the drop coming in as well. So that's just a really nice source of uh, assets coming into the plan. Uh, participation. Despite all the headwinds that we had, we managed to. Um, Get up uh, to 7715 as far as the total grow the total number of participants, about 5,000 folks actively contributing to the plan. Next is the contributions. They stayed pretty steady uh, for 2020 at around 14 million. We're still up nicely over the last five years, up about 32% over the last over the last five. And we're kind of out there fighting with one arm behind our back because we, we can't get in front of people and talk to them and talk to them. Uh, about uh, increasing their contributions. Plan assets at an uh, almost all time high, uh, actually at an all time high. This is the first time we've crossed 400, uh, 400 million. And this uh, graphic just shows you what the those last 12 months look like, uh, pretty much bottoming out last March, uh, and then 33% uh, 30, uh, increase. Asset diversification uh, here is our, our pie chart, very familiar visual for you. You see the target date funds, which we've been talking about today. That's at 39.7 million, let's call it 40 million up there in the uh, 12 o'clock position. Uh, and then of course the fixed account, what we call big blue, 128 million. That's our uh, very popular fixed account here at Metro. Um, 
I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Did want to share with you that our, our first quarter participant outreach in February, Voya celebrated Black History Month, and we sent out an email to all our participants, and it linked back to Voya's webpage honoring African American contributions in the realm of finance and business and philanthropy. Um, and it's one of the best things we've ever done. It was, it was a great piece that we did, a lot of good biographical information in there that uh, if you'd like to see it, happy to, to forward it to you. We also have some upcoming changes to the participant website, some real upgrades as far as the user friendliness. We have the improved navigation and financial wellness tools, some more manageable contribution and withdrawal options, which I'm going to talk about the contributions issue here in a second. Um, but uh, the one thing I want to point out is we do have, and this is new, the Spanish language version of the participant website that can be toggled on or off. So if an employee uh, or their family members would rather see their information in Spanish, they can do that and just toggle it on to Spanish and it will, uh, it will remember that the next time you log on. So it's fully functional in Spanish now. And then lastly, just a preview of some coming attractions, Voya's automated contribution rate change service. I have a meeting today at 1 p.m. It's our second meeting with key folks upstairs and with payroll and with finance, and we appreciate uh, the support that we've gotten from the treasurer on this. And uh, it's uh, changing up our contribution rate change. When folks want to put some more money into Metro right now, it's currently a very manual process. It's very paper driven. It involves pen and ink, you know, and I think like a feather and you dip it in the thing there and you and you fill out your form and you have to fax it back into us. It's really, really uh, labor intensive. But the way this works, you see on the chart there, a participant wants to change their contribution amount, they can go on the website, they can go on the mobile app, they can call the call center. We're going to capture that information. We're going to put it in a, in a nice spreadsheet that we call a payroll feedback file. We're going to send that back to Metro. They're going to upload it into R12. Done. Virtuous cycle starts all over again. So looking forward to that. It's it's automated, it's time efficient, and, it, and it's paperless. So really, really excited about it. Hopefully coming soon to a retirement plan near you. That's all I have. Question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. Uh, <laughs> yes. You're home. How are you doing? Um, your engagement with our friends, you know, whether they're walk-ins, call-ins, and such, how long is that typically? And is it just about the plan, or do you also get into some kind of financial? They ask you for yeah. financial education, which is so important. Right, so it depends on what they're asking for. If they're just wanting to do a contribution rate change, that can be up to. I would put it in terms of the. The reps time, gosh, they probably spend on contribution rate changes a good 15 to 20 percent of their time in the course of the week doing that. So CRC is going to remove that burden from them so they can get out and talk to people about enrolling in the plan or increasing their contributions. I think that's going to be a big, big uptick. We don't get to see a lot of uh, questions from folks about other things because all we see is their their Metro Max account. That's that's all we see. But a lot of times they will bring that up in context and we'll. We try to holistically look at it with them, but we don't we don't advise. We always just educate and inform about what Metro Max does. But um, we we do get some of that occasionally. He says you might need to ask for some help on financial advice with regard to their you know just their own personal situation. Does HR do anything with that at Metro? So we we looked into that before because that was the issue of um, um, endorsing someone. We don't know what they're right. saying and so on, but. They, they do offer some services for, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, when people are retiring and leaving, they, roll, they can roll over their money or they can whatever, make a job decision. You see a, you see a lot of info, some of the job to the, you know, but we looked at uh, like, you know, the charging, like a, a basis one fee to provide additional advice and all that, and we just got uncomfortable with endorsing someone. Uh, Seeming to endorse the body yeah, or someone. Education would be good. Well, they be, something. Right. So, yeah. so independent of the consultation with their employees, that's right. one on one. They do educational seminars, which are you know, approved, regulatory approved, so that they're not you know, advice on the specific event. Correct. Okay. Why do you see so often just in the industry or just Yeah, that's a great question. But then it's come up a lot. Contribute the max that they can and then it's not. So they do that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, they, they, that's like right in this room, right? Schedule sure. back, back there. Um, they go to different departments. Now that's been kind of stepped down due to COVID, but uh, educational, they go to police meetings. 
um, you know, just encouraging them to seek whatever sure. church building could. Mm -hmm. And they in all of our yeah, all of our messaging is pretty much about you need to contribute more. That's yeah. that's what it all kind of boils down to, and it's that's a very essential message. Yeah. And they have some great tools online that they've shown us before. It's very very educational and um, yeah. some locations. Not a sales tool, but just kind of an education. Good. Anything else? Um, Unless you want to move to seven real quick. Sorry, yeah, future so meetings. We'll see you on August 5th for lunch, right? With our ESC training. Then the next meeting we've got the night of August 26th and November 18th. Please don't hesitate if you um, want more information or updates. Um, even uh, if you want to direct us to things for further here on August 5th with NBC with all of yours. That's really all I have. Great. Anything else? Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Glad this technological voodoo works. I can end the meeting right here, right? By just. Are we done? Yes, yes, thank, thank you, you Paul. Paul. We're good. Thank you.